E360 TV proudly presents Messages of Inspirational Stories TV show. Live streaming now to millions of devices around the world on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Android TV, YouTube Live, Facebook Live Streaming. Our shows are available video on demand on these channels. And we broadcast daily Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on these channels. On Mondays, Expanding Your Business. Tuesdays, Natural Health and Wellness. On Wednesdays, we cover Mentoring Our Youth. And on Thursdays, our new show, Ideas Worth Knowing. And on Fridays, Women in Leadership. To be able to watch our television show on your favorite device, please go to e360tv.com and download the app for your favorite device. Brought to you by our producers and hosts, Jim Grant and Donna Guinwa. Along with our host, Bieta Severin Reed and Emerson Brantley. Supported by our admin team of Michaela Vidal and Gaia Guinoa Balcone Leda. And welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad that you tuned in on this Thursday because today we're going to be doing a very special presentation on ideas worth knowing. And our show is proudly brought to you by the good guys at the six minute webinar dot com. Just see, see the six minute webinar dot com uh, there on the uh, little marquee and be sure to visit there. them. Ah, I see it, too. Yeah. And the day show on every 30s, every Thursdays, we're talking about ideas worth knowing. And, you know, Emerson, I tell you what, a little birdie told me. And I want to verify, I want to clarify this with uh, and verify this with Emerson. But a little birdie told me that today our show on ideas worth knowing is going to go to the dogs. Is that right? Wow. <laughs> Who let the dogs out? I, I don't know. I got blamed for that one time, but I, I, I never did figure out who let the dogs out. That's kind of like that song that came out, oh, what was it, 25 years ago or something? Uh, Mambo number five. I, I missed the first four of them Mambos. I don't know if anybody out there in TV land caught the first four or not. But ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about our beloved pets, and we're going to you know expand on that and how People love stories about dogs, and they're especially dogs or cats and all that. But it also expands into books, and we're going to go there a little bit later. But Emerson wanted me to share. But first, Emerson, I want you to share a story about one of your beloved dogs and what that dog meant to you and your family and you're in the market for another dog, aren't you? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're looking for a new pack member. That's the way we like to talk about it. Yeah, there you, you go. Know, pack you, can't replace, like you can't replace them. Isn't that you the can't truth? Replace them. But, but if you understand, if you understand the concept of a pack, your pack is, uh, you know, it's like the empty seat at the table when you lose somebody. You oh, can't replace yeah. that person. But uh, mm. the pack itself isn't whole either. And so mm -hmm. we are, um, it's been a couple of years since we, uh, since we lost uh, Abby. And um, Abby was, um, um, was a rescue. We had some of the worst weather, tornadic activity and rain and trees blowing across the roads. And, and somebody... Whoever had um, had had pack had, had Abby in their pack before us threw her out on the street, and uh, she was a Rottweiler. And those of you who know, those are relatively large dogs. Abby probably didn't weigh more than forty pounds when our next door neighbor wandered up to our house at nine thirty at night and said, "I think this dog's looking for you." 
Because mm. a week earlier we had had we had lost our previous Rottweiler mm -hmm. um, that we'd had for twelve years. So, you know, um, and Abby had quirks. <laughs> she had her little personality. Quirks. I mean, if you were thrown out in tornadic activity and, from, and wandering around for two weeks and wondering where your pack is and how come they let you go. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so we named her Abby for Abby Normal, which <laughs> any of you who may remember the movie Young Frankenstein or Frankenstein, when Igor went to get the brain for the monster, he dropped the right brain, which was the brilliant scientist brain, and he looked around and went, ah, oh, there's Abby Normal. That's the one I'll get. Mm -hmm. And uh, But she had a heart as big as you could ever want. And uh, mm. and uh, I, we like to say, too, Jim, that, uh, you know, when you rescue, who's rescuing who? Yeah, two lives who's get res rescued. Who's rescuing who? Yeah, two lives get rescued. That's amazing. Yeah. And you were telling a story when I was sharing that because dogs, and, and I'm going to focus on dogs because that's what we've had. Um, and and mm -hmm. I and, and there's been a lot of science on this. Mm -hmm. Dogs, many thousands of years ago, wandered up to the fire and got fed a scrap of food. But over a period of time, dogs learn wild dogs learn to read us better than we could read ourselves, mm -hmm. And they do that visually. They can look at your expression. They've tested dogs with hundreds of different expressions of people and seen their reaction to anger and to sadness and to laughter and things like that. Um, they've learned to read us better than we can read each other or read ourselves. And mm -hmm. it goes beyond that. They have certain physical attributes that science is still trying to understand. They oh, understand that yeah. they have something like 300 million olfactory sensors uh, in their noses where, where we have about six. Mm. So they pick up all sorts of things, but how how they bridge that gap. So if you have a, a young child that has been diagnosed with, say, diabetes, at night, it's a difficult thing to adjust to recognizing that your blood sugar is crashing. Mm. And those of you who've watched us for a while know my, my, my wife is a lifetime diabetic, so, so this is real close to home for us. But a dog sleeping next to that child can be trained to know, to smell, to feel when that blood sugar is dropping in the child. Mm. Science is still trying to figure some of this out. Canines are amazing. Mm -hmm. They are amazing. They, they use them in search and rescue missions. They are defenders. And in fact, in many states, including the state that I live in, if if you, if you take the life of a police dog, it's considered the same thing as taking the life of a badge policeman. A police officer. Yeah, absolutely. Officer. They are yeah. officers. And mm -hmm. that's, that's a recognition of the amazing things that canines bring to us. And we're not going to spend the whole day talking about, about just the science and and, and, and physiology and the things like that. We're also going to talk about the differences that they make in our lives, right, Jim? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was sharing with Emerson earlier about one of the dogs in our lives. Uh, we, oh, yeah. we're, very fond, we're, we're very fond of Blue Heelers, the Australian cattle dog. And uh, a long story short, the very first cattle dog we had in our house, our son brought here, my son James, and he named him Napoleon. We called him Poli for short. And James got activated for uh, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan right after 911 happened here in the United States. 
And I told him, I said, don't worry about your dog. He'll be here and you get back. We'll take care of him. And then one Sunday morning, we had an incident happen because he hated certain engines going down the road, the roar of the engines. And he raced out there and my wife was with him. He was actually real close to my wife and she called him. He didn't come. And he accidentally got, well, it didn't accidentally, he, he ran up there to the cars that was coming and it uh, hit him in the face there and snapped his neck. He didn't run over him or booger him up. It just, but he was killed instantly. And, oh, I was suffering from that. And uh, about 10 minutes <clears throat> later, our son calls us from Afghanistan the very first time. Wow. And I could hardly talk. And he says, Dad, what's wrong? I said, well, son, uh, he said, Dad, tell me what's wrong. I said, James, I says, we lost Poli this morning. And he says, that, Dad, I don't want to talk about it. I can't deal with it right now. And so the conversation was obviously kind of short. The next day he called and we had a better conversation. But I went searching for, because I knew the guy had called and left a message for James. And I went back through the old, we had the old, you know, two, two ply uh, telephone message little booklet. And where, you know, you write on it and tear off the white copy, but the yellow copy remains there. And I went back through that thing and I'm looking and I'm looking and I found the guy's phone number and all his name. And I called him and told him what happened and all that. And he says, I'm going to be breeding the same mom and the same dad for the last time. Wow. And he says, you can have your pick of the litter, those pups. I says, that sounds cool. And so it just so happened when uh, the gentleman brought the pups over, a friend of mine was <laughs> interested in getting a blue healer too. So he came over. And I got the first pick and he got the second pick. <laughs> and the guy was so nice to us. And because of what we had been through and because our son was in the military, he says, I'll just charge you $35 each for each one of the dogs. And so we had our dog and that was in uh, around hmm, the middle of 2004, I think around April or May, they were born oh. and they were born in March. That's what it was. We got them about when they were uh, just about eight weeks old. And uh, so then <clears throat> on Christmas 2006, right before Christmas, uh, our friend that got the second dog uh, decided, or his wife told him, says, keeps barking at the deer, chasing my deer away because they live way out in the country. He's got to go. So James brought him home unannounced. And we put him in a pen and James says, I'm going to try to find him a home. I says, James, it's impossible to find a dog a home. And so we tried with no luck, you know. Two and a half year old dog, you know, lived out in the country. He went swimming in a pond when he wanted to. He mainly just grew up semi tame, you might say, as far as human intervention. And uh, so we told the guy we couldn't find him. He said, Well, just give him back to me. He says, My wife's boss has a place out in the country. He will use him there as a hog dog. When my wife heard that, she very seldom speaks up, but that was one time she spoke loud and clear. She said, now remember the first one was Poli, the one that we lost. Right. She says, that's Poli's little brother. Blue healers are not hog dogs. That dog is not going anywhere. There was no discussion. We was kind of like, okay. <laughs> so he was such a smart little guy too. And, uh, and we're going somewhere with this story, ladies and gentlemen. I hope I'm not boring you. Anyway, uh, if you have, if you've ever owned, if you've ever owned a dog or or another pet that was very mm -hmm. close to you, you know, you understand this story. Oh yeah, has a lot of it's... different trails. That he's taken. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to keep it short so I don't bore people and take up too much time because we've got to get to the meat of the, what this show's about. And our show is proudly brought to you by uh, Ideas Worth Knowing. And while I finish up my story, if you'd be kind enough to see if you can find, let's see here if I can find it right quick. Ideas Worth Knowing. There we go. You see our sponsor. And there it you is. can receive your complimentary, complimentary 10 books if you, from your library card if you go to ideasworthknowing.com. Yeah, if we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yep. So anyway, we had we had little uh, 
we, his original name was Rattler, and I didn't like it. I took one look at him. I said, you know what? You look like a Lobo to me. We had him outside in this fenced-in area and had a little house out there, and that's where he stayed, and that's where we fed. And had, I kept him in the fenced-in area with food and water, you know, didn't. I didn't want to have too much to do to him because they didn't want to get attached to him until after Evelyn laid down the law to us guys. That dog is staying here. And he'd watch his older brother or his brother, not older, just a little bit bigger, go in and out of the house. He observed him. And that was the smartest dog I've ever seen in my life. Because when we when I told him, I said, you're going to stay here. You're going to live with us. And we're bringing in the house the night. And I had him a little bed there, you know, and I've never seen a dog actually smile before. He was so happy. It was like he understood what I was saying. He got it. This is now his home. He's got a home like this other dog he's been watching. And instantly he was actually house trained. Now there's two other things I want to share with you very quickly. When my wife's mother had her second stroke, she stayed in Tucson, Arizona. We went out there to see her and I had to come back. And so Evelyn stayed out there for two months. And then when Evelyn came home before we brought her mother with us to live with us, um, Lobo saw her and she went over there and in the evening she sat down in her chair and he walked up to her. He laid his head on her lap right above her left knee and he rolled his head towards her like that. And she just, it was just love from both sides. And then, you know, blue healers have a mind of their own, especially if they haven't been trained as a pup. And I would call him and he'd stand and look at me. And sometimes he'd come, most of the time he wouldn't. He's kind of like a cat. Okay, I'll get with you on my terms. And I don't know where this word just came from, or this phrase, I should say, popped in my mind. And I just blurted out, I said, Lobo. He looked at me and says, Sala Hila Hola Pala. I, it was just a made up word. It doesn't mean anything. It just blurted out. And he did a beeline for me, ears laid back, happy, happy. And I thought, I don't know what I said in that <laughs> dog language. But even my wife would go outside and I hear her, Lobo, Sala Hila Hola Pala. And boy, he'd come a running. <laughs> Funny. And he lived to be a ripe old age, and we we have very fond memories of him. And, you know, Emerson, when it comes to our dogs and stories, we, we love, you know, people love to see stories about animals, especially on, you know, see the YouTube videos and things like that, especially when, you know, a dog and a duck are buddy-buddy or, you know, oh, yeah. a cat adopts a, a cat adopts a rabbit or something like that. But people also love to read stories about animals. Yes. True stories about animals. And Emerson, that's really what ideas worth knowing is all about, is being able to tell stories yeah. in the form of a book, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and that, that link that you showed there, yeah. it's not just it's not just about getting getting uh getting the books for yourself they'll eventually there'll be over a thousand best-selling mm. books that will be there that you'll be able to download for free instead of spending yeah. 25 or 30 dollars yeah you know to, to get them uh online but mm. beyond that everybody has a story inside of you oh yeah and and that story you know, the stories, the stories in our life, Jim, don't stop until we take our last breath and then they stop. That's right. And you have stories inside of you mm. that need to be told and other people benefit from it, um, mm -hmm. whether it's your children, grandchildren, mm -hmm. future generations in your family or people oh, yeah. outside of your family other people who are going through a period of time that you may be able to help guide them through with your experience and mm -hmm. knowledge. And that's a legacy. That's something that goes beyond. It goes beyond oh, our life. Yeah. And yes, it does. For many of you, that's a story about a faithful pet, a dog. Mm. Uh, as I think I shared, I think I shared this earlier, but 
on, on a different show, but during the weeks and weeks that I was in intensive care, Abby was there every night when Ann got home and she'd sit down and Abby would come and put her head in her lap, just like you were talking about with your mother-in-law. Wow. And she knew she didn't have to understand all the ins and outs of everything. She knew mm -hmm. that comforting of her pack was important right then. Oh yeah. And just as a dog will understand if, if, if an intruder comes to your house, they lay down their own life to protect mm -hmm. their pack. Oh yeah. Um, but they understand, they understand that emotional anguish, that, that emotional, mm -hmm. the fear and the, the, the doubt and the hurt and the things that the things that mm -hmm. we're, are, we think are just going on inside of our head, they're picking mm -hmm. it up and they're picking it up on a oh, hundred yeah. different levels that we can oh. not even begin to understand. Oh yeah. Because a dog's love is unconditional for the pack, <clears throat> as you word. say. Unconditional. <clears throat> and they know when you need tender love and care. Yep. And what if we were that sensitive to our family and our friends? Mm-hmm. We are to a degree, but not like a dog. I mean, a dog puts their emotions, their personal agendas, whatever it might be, whatever you want to call it. They put it on hold because now you are the center of their attention. Yep. You are the one that needs They're to the center know of the universe. Yeah, that you belong to that yeah. pack. And that's a wonderful feeling. And Emerson, you were talking earlier about, you know, how the stories, we all have stories in us. One of the things that popped in my mind as you were talking about that was that think about the family history, your family oh, yeah. history, ladies and gentlemen, think about all of the stories that just drifted away, were never told because no one ever recorded it. And Mike Lewis has He's got over a thousand best-selling authors, and this is not about trying to sell you to become an author or write a book or anything like that. But what Mike does, oh my goodness, he makes it so easy because I've been, I've got three or four books, uh, four books actually in writing at some stage, and they've, they've been there for 10 years or more, you know, you know, you, you know how that goes. You get ready to write something and then you, you know, you you get a brain cramp and you quit and then you come back to it, you know, and then you put it off and then you don't get back to it. But Emerson. Well, but in like about an hour, understand. hour and a half, Mike pulled out from you everything that, <laughs> that he needed to take and turn into a book. Yeah. Because he's done it yes, so many he did. times. Oh, yeah. Now, explain to the folks out there in TV land exactly how Mike does that. I mean, I know, you know, but explain to someone who may have thought, hmm, I would like to share my family history mm -hmm. with my family, but getting time to write it, I mean, l l folks, listen to, listen to what Emerson has to share with you. Go ahead, oh, Emerson. Oh, Mike can do it on a Zoom call or on a phone call and just interview you and talk with you. He'll send you, he'll send you a few things to kind of, jog your thinking and guide your thoughts um mm -hmm. one of the things he did with uh, jim was uh was he said be thinking about uh, uh, uh about 10 points that you want to make having yeah. to do with doing the the, the book that, that that he's working on was had, had to do with doing doing what you're doing doing uh your own tv show or podcast or things like mm -hmm. that that was what that, yeah that was the book and yeah. so what are the what are the five or ten things that you want to make sure the people get? Mm -hmm. and then right, right. What are what are what are uh, what are a couple of questions that would be good questions? Uh, and what things do you want to be sharing with the people out of that? And then Mike will just simply mm. let you talk. He's a just master like at. It, yeah, it, it's it, just it, a. No, if somebody else is sitting there in the same in the same room with you, and ask you to tell them about 
this particular element or something that you know, something from your business or something from your career mm -hmm. or something from your history or something mm -hmm. that you learned from your parents or your grandparents or, or yeah, some or truths the, and things yeah. that you figured out over yeah. the years. Yeah, yeah even a like hobby that. that you love. I mean, you may be yeah, an expert fisherman. You, yeah, oh, goodness gracious. And you know, our pets, ladies and your pets. <laughs> oh, yeah, your pets, absolutely. And see, Mike has that ability to ask you questions and by doing the thing that he sent you, just what are the 10 points? Okay. And, you know, he, he has that because he's got over, a, he's created over a thousand best selling authors. The guy's got a boatload of of information you can email mike at mike at ideas worth knowing.com but my point being is that imagine having just a warm friendly conversation of sharing things and having a person that has the expertise to draw that information out whether you're talking about your the pets you've had in your life and their quirky personalities and the things that you know that you giggle at now that maybe you got a little upset at then, you know, and, uh, or it could be, you know, when you were growing up, people that, you know, relatives and families and friends that made an impression on you, mentors and things like that. Right. And you just want to recall that this was my life and this is what I experienced. This is what shaped me into the person I am today because We've all been there, Emerson. When the other day, my granddaughter, who just graduated from, she's now a full-fledged CPA. She took those four major exams, and each one was a major test. Those, those of you that's taken that route, you know what, what it's about. And her and her friends all passed each four exams the first time, which was wow. pretty, pretty impressive. Wow. And I shared with her what I'm doing, and she wrote me back two words. Wow. Exciting. And see, there's so many things that I do behind the scenes that I don't even think about. Sure. That my family doesn't even know. <laughs> they may not even care, to be honest with you. <laughs> but when they find out the Paul Harvey side of the story, it, they have a different perspective of you. And, you know, one, one classic example, if I can use this, my mother always made her own barbecue sauce. And my sisters were there in the house. I had three sisters that, you know, and they were there always had their mom Jim, in the Jim. kitchen. Is this Texas barbecue sauce, North Carolina barbecue sauce? No one? My mother was, my mother was, was born and raised in cow pens, uh, South Carolina and Gaffney Carolina. area. And she, okay, so. There you go. And then she, uh, her, my dad was from Shelby, North Carolina. When they got married, they lived in Shelby. That's where I'm from originally. Everywhere you go in the country, every region is different. Oh, the way they do their barbecue yeah. is totally mm. different. Yes, my, yes, sir. You're right. And mother always made hers at home. I knew she used ketchup. I knew she used... Uh, some mustard in there, but she just mixed oh, different yeah. things together. And ladies and gentlemen, I kid you not. And I'm not saying this because this is my mother. I'm saying this because <laughs> we would, we used to have those big, you know, dinners at the church, you know, and everybody would big, big potluck dinners and everybody would come. And mother, her specialty was barbecued chicken. Oh, wow. And she made a lot of that. And I'm telling you, that was the first place, the first plate that got emptied 100% of the time. So mother used to make, take a little, a special box with us so that we could have the chicken because, man, some <laughs> of those guys, man, they get in there and they kind of like, you know, they, like they got a grabbling hook there and pick it up. I mean, everybody loved her barbecued chicken. So one day I called my sisters and I went one of my sisters and I says, you remember how mom used to make the barbecue sauce? Oh yeah, mom made it all the time and it was delicious. I said, I know. I said, do you remember the recipe or anything like that? Well, uh, no. She says, I know she used this and she gave me three or four items that she used. 
But she says, Mary will know. So I called Mary and I told her, I had my sister, I talked to my sister, and these are the three or four grains. She said, Yeah, yeah, she used that, but she also used some brown sugar and she used some molasses. And I'm going, like, Okay, all right. Do you know what quantities it was? I mean, mom just, oh, no. you know, no, 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 no. No, no. That's what, and she made it with hands of love. That's why it was so delicious. But my point being, that tasty barbecue sauce that could make me drool like a hound dog at a picnic, <laughs> if I saw it or saw it today, you know, uh, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone forever because no one saw the need or the importance to record it or write it down. We couldn't even get all the ingredients down, much less forget how, well, how much a dab of this and a dash of that and a pinch of the other, whatever. Familiarity breeds contempt. Yes. And yeah. think about in your life, especially yeah. some of the things you know about your family or your friends, that those stories are going to die when you are no longer on planet Earth. That's right. And some of your uh, younger relatives would, they would enjoy those stories. And the way and Mike not does just it, the barbecue uh, sauce, it's oh, the story yeah. behind it. Yes, yes. And the person yes. behind it. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. if you go back 50 or 100 years, all you have is a name on a piece of paper. Yeah. And you have a birth date and a dash and an end mm -hmm. date. Maybe, you know, they were a doctor, maybe they were a farmer, maybe they were on the whatever. But you don't know, you, you know, getting to know that person, the story tells you about the person. I had an uncle, yes. my Uncle Lewis, and every year at one of our, we had two family reunions. This one was on my mother's side. And uh, I remember when I was about 13 or 14, I got to sit up all night long with the men folk. Uh, and uh, we were barbecuing uh, Boston butt. Okay. So these, this wasn't chicken, this pork barbecue. And so right. I, we had 15 or 20 of these on this grill. I and mean, this, this is a big deal. And uh, we sat up all night long. Mm. And uh, every 20 minutes or so, we would, we would take the sop, which was just an old, like a dish towel on a stick. We'd dip mm -hmm. it in the, in, the, in the liquid and we'd sop them and we'd turn them over and then we'd sop the other side. Mm -hmm. So one night I asked my Uncle Lewis, I said, Uncle Lewis, I said, I said, what is it in your sop? Because the sop, I understood by that point, the sop was what made it really special. Yeah. The sauce was added after it came off the way that they cooked it, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And now this is in Georgia, which is very similar to South Carolina, and 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 you know the, <laughs> the these Carolinas, kinds of yeah. trends and things all they're they're not by state lines or anything, okay? Right. Oh yeah, they're by family lines and by regions. Mm -hmm. And my uncle Lewis, I'll never forget this, Jim. He looked at me. He said, "Well," he said, um, "You take half mustard. You take half vinegar." And you take half black pepper. Mm. Okay. So part of that story, it wasn't a third, a third, a third. Okay. Part of that story it was a half, was half, half. Uncle, it was when my uncle thought, and 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 he was he was he was um, he was brilliant. I mean, oh, when, yeah. when when Savannah was uh, <laughs> when the great renovations begin in savannah in the i'd say 40s or 50s or 60s right where right. they begin renovating all of the old great old downtown places that have been there since the 1700s and all mm -hmm. and and he was a brick mason he 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 and he and his business redid a lot of the bricks and things for a lot of those old houses that were that you now wow. see when you go on the tours of downtown savannah georgia and you yeah. know he, so he's very smart he, he wasn't you know but the way that he thought and the way that he did his sop was you take half mustard half vinegar and half black pepper mm. and that's still the sop that i make today when i'm going to when i'm going to sop 
uh, you know, uh, a meat that we're going to be smoking for a, for a long period of time. Mm. So that's a story. So, you, and the story so is your three story. halves make a whole. <laughs> well, yeah, but the story, the story tells you more than just here's the recipe. The story tells you right, more than just, right. You know, and and and, and the uh, the events and the ways that it that it happened and, and, the, and the first time somebody tasted something and 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 how oh. it mattered when uh, when when they brought over a person they were dating and that was their first introduction to the family mm -hmm. and and, and mm -hmm. breaking bread and eating that's just one single example of yeah. how your stories that are just part of who you are yes matter because oh, yeah. they are not part of the next generation of next generation of next generation mm. they're certainly not part of somebody who doesn't know you oh yeah and, and when you are able to share these things um how many times i gotta ask you this jim because it happens to me a lot or it has happened to me a lot where i'll be sharing something with one of my kids or grandkids and they'll go how did you learn to do that oh yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> that's part of your story and they haven't learned to do it and it's revelation knowledge for them and it, yeah. and it can be all it can be the simplest little thing and mm, it matters. amen and the thing i gotta is, i gotta tell you our stories Good. last and when our mm -hmm. stories stop being told that's the end of it and yeah. we have to make sure that that's not the end mm. of it i i uh i gotta tell you a story about my dad Okay. I didn't know this till after I was married, Evelyn and I, we were living in Bisbee, Arizona. My father came out, mom, mom and dad came out to visit us and Eve, Evelyn had a piano and it was in our house. She had it since she was a little girl. And, uh, I walked in and my dad was sitting there and he was playing the piano. I looked at him and cause I had never heard, I knew my dad could play guitar. And I knew my dad had a an, had an ear for music. He could listen to a song three or four times on the jukebox and then play it on a guitar. Wow! That was a that was a gift he had. I didn't get that gift. I mean, if you want to hear some music, we better have a stereo system or something here, <laughs> and we better have the kind of music you want to hear. Otherwise, I had, I had an it. uncle like that, and yeah. and all of his all of his uh, kids were like that too. Yeah, and. Uh, I walked in and I was kind of shell shocked and I looked at him and, and after he finished playing, I said, dad, I didn't know you could play the piano. You know, he said to me, Emerson, he looked at me and he said, boy, there's a lot of things about me. You don't know. <laughs> How true is that? And it's, so, and it's so true. That's why, you know, being able to sit down with Mike over a warm, friendly environment, and let him record your story, no matter what it is. It's your story. It's part of your life. It's what shaped you. And for him to have that unique ability to download the entire script, the recorded script, and turn it into and clean, clean up some of this verbiage I'm using here. But anyway, convert it into print and then send it to you and says, OK, because you know, he has the ability to realize that you were popping around like I was like hot popcorn on a stove because, oh, yeah, I remember this. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's fine. That's cool with Mike because he understands ideas are going to generate more thoughts right. and more thoughts are going to you know pop out there. And you forgot this. You forgot that. So but he has that unique ability to to cut and splice and put things <laughs> in a nice flowing information. And it's impressive. <coughs> it really is. And then to be able to, to, you know, have your very own story recorded that you can share with family and friends. Because we all know from our loved ones who are no longer with us, there was a lot of things in their life that they took to the grave, that they would never oh, have yeah. the opportunity to share. And, you know. Well, and it might not even be you. It, maybe, it, maybe it's a great aunt or a grandparent. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's somebody who was, um, mm -hmm. you know, who had a profound influence on your life. Oh, um, yeah. 
you know, it could be, folks, we don't live forever. And, and uh, they may not be thinking about it. Nobody else may, mm -hmm. perhaps nobody else is thinking about it. But the truths that we learn, the life lessons that we have. Yeah. The little, the little things that we figured out along the way and the, mm -hmm. the life changing things for us that now are all old news. Mm. Um, they're not old news. No, they're not old news for somebody else who doesn't know them. And, um, <laughs> our names at the end of the day, if you've ever seen any of those genealogical books or anything, our names at the end of the day will have our first name, our last name. It'll have our birth date, might have the place where you're born. It may have the name of your spouse if you're married. Um, it may have the name of uh, your children, you know, mm -hmm. if you've ever looked at any of these genealogical sites. That's usually about it, you know? Yeah. If you, yeah. you may have, if, if you like, uh, uh, I had a grandfather who was a country doctor and there were some newspaper articles that I have, you know, mm. about him, but, but he died in 1959 folks. Why? Unless mm. I talked to somebody who knew him at the time, mm -hmm. I'm proud of him. It was my grandfather. It's a name on the paper. Sure. Uh, my great grandmother. Here's an, here's a great example, Jim lost to history. My great grandfather was an itinerant Baptist minister. He had he had over a dozen churches on a circuit. This is in the 1920s and 30s in the horse mm. and buggy and dirt road days. Oh wow! Going from town to town, little towns, every week, every week, every mm. week. These were assigned to him, and um, and there was a chapter uh, in um, there was a, a book series called Baptist Biographies, um, published around mm -hmm. 1920. Or so, and he was the third or fourth uh, pastor that they featured uh, in that book, and that's all great and wonderful, and I'm proud of him. But there's a there's an untold story there in the family, and you women especially listen to this, okay? My great grandmother, there are no chapters written about her. Mm. There are no newspaper articles about her. When he, as a younger man in the 1890s or so, he felt the call of God, as he would have put it in his words. Mm -hmm. She said, if you're going to be a preacher, you're going to go have schooling. I'm not going to be embarrassed by my husband being in front of a church and not being educated. And mm. she took in borders and she took in laundry this is in the 1890s folks think about this yeah, yeah. women having careers and jobs at that time that wasn't something that was common no it wouldn't oh. she took in borders and she took in laundry and she paid for him to go to seminary mm. she's behind that chapter in that series yeah. of books. She's never mentioned she, in it. She's the unsung that story, hero. It's a story that matters. I have three daughters. Mm. I have four granddaughters. That's mm -hmm. a story to me that matters. That yes, they it does. Know, that they know. And if you don't tell these stories, who will? Exactly. If you don't tell them, who will? Exactly. You know, and I met with some cousins here. We were talking about my Aunt B here a few years ago. And uh, they had questions and I had questions. And I found out things about my Aunt B that was extremely impressive to me. Uh, this woman could make a meal out of nothing. I mean, she was kind of like Jesus when it come to feeding his 5,000 people with, you know, a few loaves of bread and a few fish or whatever. But I'm serious because we would go down. She'd come to our house and, you know, visit with us and spend the night and stuff like that. And she had me. Now, I was only about 
10 or 11 years of age, she'd have me get in my mother's 1948 fluid drive Dodge, okay? <laughs> she'd say, drive me down to the farm. I want to pick some poke salad. And poke so salad. I could barely... I could barely reach the pedals. I was small for my age anyway, and I really wasn't a big guy. It's never been a big guy. But anyway, we drove down there. And Oak, salad is a, Oak salad is a land that grows in the south, folks, and it's what a lot of poor people would eat. Yes. Back in the and day. I didn't, and I saw her prepare it and all, but I did not yeah. know that poke salad had to be boiled and strained mm -hmm. and drained. Because if you didn't, it was poisonous. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. And she she worked on that. We're talking in the summertime, no air conditioning. She's hot. She's sweaty. And she's working like a beaver trying to build a dam in the middle of the flood to feed us five little youngins herself, my mom and dad. And she sent me out to the smokehouse to get a ham. And I brought the ham in. And uh, she prepared homemade biscuits because my mother had broke her arm. And oh, she oh, says, oh. you're, you know, that's, that's why she went to all this trouble for us on this. I just remembered. And she made homemade biscuits. Drop biscuits. These suckers. Huh? Drop biscuits, cathead biscuits. No. Oh, these were these were rolled. I mean, these things okay. were like miniature okay. pancakes. I mean, these things were good size. I know. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh she made it from scratch with flour and yeast and everything. And long story short, that night we had ham, we had mm. poke salad, we mm. had scrambled eggs, some pinto beans, and biscuits. Well, that was a feast, Jim. Oh, gosh, we ate like a, oh, I mean, she made crazy. enough for us. I mean, to say they were leftovers, they were just meals that we were just eager to look for the next day. And I remember one time it was real hot and she came over and that used to, they used to call it says cotton nights because we grew cotton. You be very hot and humid during the night is cotton night. Good for the crops. Whatever that meant, I don't know. But anyway. She uh, took a cornbread and made a big uh, cake of cornbread in a frying pan. And we pour had some beans. bacon grease down in it, put it in the oven, get that nice and sizzling. And then you pour the uh, batter in so it's all crunchy on the bottom and soft uh, on top. I tell you, and uh, uh. that night I had some cornbread. Her cornbread was so delicious. It was almost like a uh, like a cake. It was that had that very unique flavor to it. It didn't taste, you know, wasn't crumbly or you know like a lot of cornbread is. And I took the right. cornbread, ladies and gentlemen. I remember I broke it up into a dish, poured some sweet milk over it, and that was a treat for me. Mm. And I remember that night I slept so good. And the next morning I told her about. I remember telling my aunt B how well I slept. She said, "Well, son," she said, "That's because you gave your body what you needed to nourish it, and it could fully rest." And you know, but here again, how she did things, her love and compassion to help others. And she was the kind of woman, I did not know this till this was my cousins, that when someone was sick, she answered the call of duty. And she didn't care if they were black or white. They were friends because, you know, it's like we say here, we're all brothers and sisters by different mothers. And that's true. And. You know, she'd go well, in the like house. my grandfather. Like yeah. my grandfather, I was told over and over again, and I and I'm I, I'll just say it. This is in a southern in a southern town in Georgia, mm -hmm. and he died in 1959. So so we're talking about people remembering a time back in Jim Crow South, 1950s. Oh yeah, 40, 50s, that not a not mm -hmm. especially not a good time for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I had I had more than one black folk. Then I stopped to ask, they'd show me, if they'd tell me how to get to Doc Brantley's house or to Doc Brantley's, uh, where his office had been. They mm -hmm. said, oh, you related to Doc Brantley? You know, 
Doc Brantley, he never had no back door. Hmm. When people came to him. I get it. I get it. They were all the same. Yeah. Sounds like the back, the back. would have connected. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My dad would, too, because it was common for us. I was very blessed and I was very fortunate and I'm very thankful. Very, 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 very thankful, not only for my family, but the, the people who lived around me there. Uh, I saw, you know, black people and white people intermingling and there was no, no, no issues whatsoever. And I've told the story here before. It was common for uh, on a Sunday dinner for dad to invite one of his friends over and the gentleman just happened to be black. So what? And he would sit there at the, at the dinner table with us. And, and, you know, we'd have mashed potatoes, usually chicken or something like that. And he was just as welcome at that table as I was. And, and I, and I tell people, I am so thankful that I was brought up in that type of environment. Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't realize, like I, I didn't realize as a kid, and I'm sure you didn't either. Oh, but that was not necessarily a, the way everybody was being brought up at that time. Not at all. Not at all. And uh, well, it was I an never exception heard, to the rule. And I recognize that. Yeah. But I'm thankful and, for that, too. Yeah. My brother, uh, <laughs> him and his friends, black and white, they went down and built a cabin in the woods. And Pee Wee Guffy, who was one of the smaller white guys, they got the, you know, men and the other guys, uh, they were telling ghost stories. And Pee Wee got so scared he would not go outside of that log cabin they built in the woods to relieve himself. And he was begging one of them to go out and say, I ain't going out there. Might be a bear out there, you know, might be a, some, you know, bunch of chickens want to get, get a hold of me. And, you know, and, and they had him so scared, the poor guy didn't even want to go out there. But see, those are funny stories. And, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about our personal life and all that. And one final thing I like to say about my family. I think Jimmy's right. Has a couple more books in him. What do you think, folks? <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness! But I remember my dad telling me about his dad, my grandpa Grant, Robert Grant. He was very good with cement. That was his specialty. That was his calling in life. And when they built the Cleveland County Courthouse there on the Shelby, North Carolina Square. My dad told me, he says, you know, when that when that building was going to be constructed back in 18, whatever it was. He said, uh, my dad, your grandpa was written in the contract that he would be the one that would mix all of the mortar and the cement because he had a unique talent that the cement and the mortar that he mixed never cracked. And I hmm. said, really, I didn't know that. And I was 14 or 15 when he told me that didn't mean too much to me, to me then, right, but right. I really respect that now. And I told my sisters about it. I said, we never heard that story. I said, well, you think dad told me a lie? She says, no. I said, we need to go back and see if we can research the records. I'm sure the courthouse would have the original records of the contract, who the, who the people were. Cause my dad said, yes, he was recorded in there that he would be the one responsible for mixing all of the concrete in any mortar because he had a reputation that when he mixed it, it would never dry up and crack. And I look at some of the brick houses I've lived in. I thought about that as a boy, they could have took some lessons from my grandpa. <laughs> you know what I mean? But those Emerson, are great things. And, and, and you can only tell those in stories because it's not something. Yes. That, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, anybody would ever be able to figure out or know that there was any difference between the name that they see on that piece of paper on that TV, on that mm -hmm. uh, computer screen was different than any other name that they might see. Mm. Yes, because their lives mattered. Your life matters. And what really enhances your, your family, especially the younger ones coming up in the family, relatives, whether they're nieces, nephews, whatever, is understanding and listen up folks appreciating who you are who you were yes and what you went to to become the person that you that you became 
because that's what life's about. We learn from lessons yep. and we go and grow. And Emerson, our time is gone. My goodness I gracious. It's about gone, Jim. Yeah, I got I got at least one or two more stories, but I'll save them for next time. So I got a thunder <laughs> boomer coming. I don't know if y'all might be able to hear some of that thunder in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure and visit ideasworthknowing.com. Yes. There's still Mike is upgrading that site with more and more books. And he's been out. We want to give a shout out to Mike. And we hope and pray he gets feeling better soon so he can be back. And that way you won't have to put up with me. You, Mr. Mike will be here. But sincerely. But do go yes. there and register. And they may have it up now. I don't know. But you will receive a complimentary library card uh, where you can you you may have a a, a spouse of a significant other a friend whoever you can sit down with them and go through what's available there and say hey i think i'd like to have this book i'm like okay you want that book i'll get this book here and i'll both, I'll both of you sign up it's okay yeah exactly absolutely yeah. that's that's a that's a better idea than what i had <laughs> like it's actually but, setting up a nonprofit to be able to continue to do this on perpetuity oh. so yeah. And see right there, that's something that family and friends need to know about Mr. Mike, how he gives. Setting up a nonprofit so this could be ongoing giving and giving. That in itself is a legacy. It really is. And on behalf of Mike, since he can't be with us today, we give him a shout out. I hope he gets us today. We sincerely hope that we said something that inspired you to tell your story because you matter. And above yes. all things, love yourself first, then you can love others. We'll see you tomorrow. And you have a wonderful day. Bless you. And 